Hello, how are you doing? Good in yourself? I'm good, thank you. Welcome back. <laughs> yes, ma'am. How's your uh, spring break? It was nice. I needed the break. How was yours? Uh, packed with stuff to do. <laughs> Isn't it always? <laughs> what did you achieve during spring break? Let me ask that. Uh, uh, a whole lot of not everything I got it. I wanted to do. <laughs> it was just overwhelming, huh? Yes, oh. uh, this and that and that. oh, oh, you're not working. I mean, no, you're 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 uh, you're not in school, so now you can stay later at work. <laughs> I was like, man, I really regret telling him that I'm on spring break. Oh, well. Summer is coming up real soon. And so if you're not taking classes, you can enjoy a little bit of time. <laughs> oh, I'm taking classes, but I'm not going to tell them that, uh, that uh, anything, just because I know it's really accelerated. And uh, I think that um, my, my classmate, he wants to take, uh, he wants, like, wants us to take Cal 2 together. I'm like, oh, I don't know, man. Calculus mm -hmm. 2, on, on a, I'm already overwhelmed with Calculus 1. Mm. I think if you put your mind to it, you can get it done. I think a lot of the students, they prefer the short term because they can finish very quick. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, even for us, when we're teaching the shorter term, it's it's a little bit more intense because you're covering double the units. So yeah, but at least you do have a little bit of break during the summer in between uh, the classes. So it's True. not too bad. <laughs> yeah, I want to maintain a, a good grade. So um, it's like, uh, you know, if it's fast, if it's accelerated pace, and if it, uh, do I sacrifice my grade if if if, if that if it comes down to it? Because uh, it's very competitive, you know, going to uh, university. Like university, depending on which one you want to go to, very competitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, after all of that, I think eventually you you end up at a university, um, regardless, I'm pretty sure. And then, yeah, I mean, a lot of people are concerned about straight A's and things like that. But do your best. And that's what it's going to be. Ultimately, you're already working. I think it's for promotion purposes. But that's just personal goal just to get a good GPA. And it feels good to do that. I encourage everybody to continue their education and do well in it because it's your investment. But, you know, just try your best and at least have a little bit of fun while you're doing it. <laughs> All right. True. So, True. Let's, yeah, let's um, let's get started. It's 601. Welcome back. Um, I hope that you had a good spring break. I did have a little bit of a break and it's unusual for me, but um, I did enjoy a little bit of time off. So we're back on track. So this week, um, let me get into screen share. I did post the project and I will spend some time to talk about that later on. Um, but we are going to hit stack and subroutine because your project is gonna require that you write um, uh, routines or subroutines and then implement stack, which is uh, just a memory location on where you can uh, push and pop, um, you know, for data purposes. Okay. So um, we do have a full loaded week. As you can see, we do have a quiz. I try to hold it off till after spring break, but there is an extra credit opportunity. I encourage you to use the extra credit to review as some of us just came back from spring break, um, you know, we might have left our mind at the beach or the vacation spot or household chores, whatever it is. So um, short quiz, not too long, 10 questions, four points each, um, you'll be able to achieve it. And then we are going to do mat fast multiplication in LC3, where we are going to look at ways to um, implement, implement operations to, uh, to multiply in a quicker uh, for in a quicker manner, as I, I should say. Okay. And uh, so I hope to have a little bit of time later on to address the course project, what you need to do. Um, and as we are working in team, we need to plan now, right? Um, so you do have close to or about six weeks 
to get it done. Um, and so if you start every week a little bit, you'll be able to accomplish that before the final exam where all your classes will have final exam. Okay, so download the notes um, and then take a look at your assignment. We're gonna go over that in a few minutes. So let me get to chapter nine and 10 notes. So as we are wrapping up some of the chapters, there will be time for you to dedicate, class time to dedicate to um, your project, okay? We are gonna do most of the lab in the lab manual except for the last few labs. So I wanted to give you time to work on your team um, project. So I will let you know, and then I will cover final review to work week 13. Um, so you should have like, you know, a couple of weeks just to prepare, review for final and so on. Okay, so in this week, um, we are gonna talk, we're gonna touch back on trap. I think we talked about that right before spring break. Um, and we've been looking at the vectors on how to use some of the pseudo operation it, it, with trap. And you started to see how we write subroutine and we jump to subroutine and subroutine in LC3 is equivalent to functions in C or C++. And so this week we're gonna focus more on the internal aspect, the concept on what, you know, on how the processor sees things. And so you can understand whenever you write a function, what's happening with the compiler. So um, to start, System calls just gonna be operations that is for a specific IO device register. And it would have a sequence in how it would use, okay? So we talked about input output. Some devices are only input, some devices are only output. And then you do have devices that are both. So, on the simplest level, if we're looking at mouse and keyboard and the monitor, right? Those are your simple IO devices. And so IO resources are shared so that way the user can interact with the program. But in, at the machine level, we have to look at how storage and processor sees all of these things. So IO resources are shared and if you run into errors or if there's mistake that can affect the program and not only that, it also affects how the user can interact with the system through the program. So the service routines are also referred to as system call and it is performed on the lower level. So, Beyond the OS, on the lower level, what you would see is that there will be a control set of operations and that's considered to be privileged. That means that it's protected and only the system can access those operations. So when you're dealing with, you know, input and output devices, a lot of the time, let's say that we use a USB device, we plug that into a port, which is your USB port. Your USB drive is an input and an output device as it, we can store into it and we can extract data from it. But in order to control that USB device, right, um, there has to be instructions for how the processor can access resources that would utilize that input and output operations on that USB which means that the system would have specific instructions and subroutines or system call in order to access that particular device. So now at the higher level, when you move up the level and when we get to the operating system, which is on the software side, the operating system utilizes drivers and firmware in order to communicate with the device, mostly drivers. So in order to access those type of devices, right, it needs to understand what that device is and that's coming from the firmware. And it needs to be able to 
utilize some of the operations that the user want that device to do. For example, if I want to save a file to that device, so it has to utilize the driver in order to, to process that. So here it talks about how the OS would take control of the computer where it would handle the trap instructions. And so when we're looking at trap, we would see trap is being used for in, out, right? For um, halt, for various things, or even in some cases, we would use it when we are jumping to things, okay? To a different part of our program. So to expand on the trap mechanism, it would consist of various service routines. And this is how the operating system is gonna be able to, um, to, to communicate with the actual hardware and be able to process a certain operations or the processor is able to process a certain operations for what the user needs. For example, if the application required the user to have input, Right, that trap mechanism allows the system to wait for that signal, okay? So really, when we look at the background of this, we would see that the way that this is set up is just like your normal instructions that you see, right? We talked about how we can have data movement instructions, or we would be able to have some kind of arithmetic instructions. So in the trap instructions, you are still using um, your word size here. And it uses the trap vector to really identify a specific system call. So therefore the vector value is never the same in different instructions. So your in is different than your out and so on. So this value here is a byte. So it's an eight bit index that would be relevant to specific service routine in the lower level, or in our case, that will be LC3. And so, and with that vector, it would be associated with specific memory address. And so therefore it would be stored Using a table, that's how it's able to associate that memory address to the, the trap vector value. So here you can see that if it is zero extended into the 16 bit, it is zero extended into the 16 bit, and it would go to the table to look up a specific address that's relevant to that value. And so then it's gonna take that address and it's gonna put it into the program counter or it's put it the next instruction from the program counter and it's gonna put it into register seven. So R7, as we talked about this before, is being utilized for the trap mechanism. And so in the diagram, this is what you see. So the address from the program counter goes to R7 and R7 is your register, basically it's a temporary file. And then your, your instructions is then gonna be loaded, the address of that is gonna be loaded into the MAR, okay? And then the, the, the data for that is gonna be pulled and put it into the program counter. So where is the data coming from? It's really coming from the actual memory. So the, this example is for the return instruction, so the RET. So when you write a function, the purpose of a function is to return from a function, and that will be equivalent to the subroutine. So if you're returning from the subroutine, this is what's happening, that your the address from the program counter gets loaded to R7, and that's how it's gonna know what the, that, the section of the memory where that subroutine exists, okay? And it's gonna be able to go to the location where your return value would be. So that way it would load that into the MDR, okay? 
I think we also expand on this last time when we talked about return. So now um, let's pause there and let's go to our assignment. So for chapter nine, for the first question, it asks you to describe the importance of system service call at the low level. And for the system service call, it's gonna require privilege operations. It's only the system is gonna be able to access that, okay? Because if you study operating system, you would see that after the operating system, you would have what's called a hardware abstraction layer. And through that hardware abstraction layer, the OS would be able to communicate with the hardware. But in that abstraction layer, you would have privileged operations where no user interaction would reach that point. So here we can say that it would have privileged operations that require protection. And so if you ever look into Windows PC, and even when you look at file level, right? Like let's say you look at the property of the file and you would go into like the security tab for Windows 10, you would see that the creator for that file has full access to that particular file, but the system also have full access to that file because it needs to be able to take that file and put that into a storage location which is then whenever you open the file, it needs to operate, right? The instructions to be able to activate or open that particular file from a, from a location of the storage, okay? So the processor needs to be able to understand those instructions. So therefore it requires the specific knowledge for IO device register and the sequent operations in order to use them. And also your IO resources are shared with the across the programs because sometimes you would have modular based design where you would have multiple files or multiple applications are sharing the resources, okay? And if there are errors, then we would run into issues with the applications and also it would impact the user. So that you can also pull from the notes. For number two, it asks you what happens after the service call is initiated? So the program is, and your book refers to this as a user program because most of the time we write the software to for the user to interact with the system. So the program would invoke the system call. And your operating system code will perform the operation. So at the software level, right, the code for the, the OS is gonna perform the operation. And, and then it's gonna return the control to the user program. So when you're running your application uh, on top of your OS, this is what's happening is that when you're using a certain mechanism of, of that particular program, for example, if I'm using a program to edit video, then what it's gonna do is gonna invoke the system call because in the editing video, I'm actually using IO, right? I have to click my mouse in order to drag a certain spot of my video. And with that, it's gonna modify how my video is stored. And then it also need to display what I'm doing. So the OS at that time is gonna take and perform the operations where it's gonna be able to send that, right? To the processor where it's gonna break down to the machine level and it's gonna operate the instructions for the IO. Then after that, it's gonna return, the next step is to return that back to the user program so the user can see right, the impact of the changes as I'm editing my video and I'm changing some part of my video. So this is more of a summarized process because in step B, you do see that there's extended operations behind the scene beyond the, uh, the, the OS code operations there. 
Then for number three, what is the purpose of trap vector in the service routine? It is used by the program to transfer control to the OS because we have to bring it to the software level from the lower level in order for the, the user program to interact. So trap vector is used for specific operation. Okay, so we have to bring it from the low level, trap mechanism is on the low level, and we need to bring that to the OS so that way it can interact with the user program. Any question? So in the return or your RET instruction, it really entails a jump instruction or jump, okay? So that will be JMP. And that's gonna be able to get the system back to the user program at the right location. Why? Because the address is loaded to the register. And that's how it's going to be able to reference where that program would be. So LC3 assembly language let us use return in place of the jump R7. So depending on the assembly language, some language you would require a jump. And then um, more of the C-based language, you would have the return. OK. So the concept there is that we're going to go to R7 to be able to obtain the address of our next instruction, which is loaded from, from the PC or where your program counter. So it will pick up to where your program will be. Any question? So as you write your lab, right? throughout the next couple of weeks in your project, you need to think about right, what's happening behind the scene and that's important. And understanding that is really understanding the architecture and the operation for the architecture. Okay, so um, let's come back here. Here it talks about, this is where that question, the answer for that question comes from, right? Here it talks about your return instructions. And so if you can visualize that, here is your program, okay? And then it's gonna put that into your system control block. And then it's gonna also include the service routine. And these are the addresses that it's using. So it's gonna look up the starting address, okay? And it's going to transfer the service routine. Then when you have return, it's going to jump to R7 because R7 stores the address. And that's where it's going to be able to see which address is used for the instruction in that program. So whichever language you write, whether it's C, assembly, right? Um, in C, we talked about how the compiler handled this. So that, that's, that's you know at the lower level. And in assembly, we really work directly with the lower level. So, so here is the LC3 program that's using track with the vector. So instead of using the in or you know your pseudo instruction, we would have the trap here in place of that and then the out, okay, and then the halt. So you still write your program as it would be that we've been doing since week two. What we would have is instead of, you know, the pseudo instruction, you can have the trap with the vector value. And so when you look at the simulator, when you look at that line, it actually shows you the trap with the vector because your similar your simulator actually translate your pseudo instruction into the trap instruction and the vector value. Okay, any question? 
And so in this program, simply, right, we ask you convert. And then we um, implement for the input and the output. So we have the in, because as we do the in, we have to ask you convert. And then we are going to show on the monitor. And then it's going to keep doing that. OK, so that's just a snippet. So more of a complete program, you're going to have to add in additional things for the purpose, you know, because it's that section of the program doesn't really entail like a complete program. So. And then for your output service routine, it would look something like this, right? Where you would have the return value here. So it's gonna be back to the user program. So if we write that, we have to store to register seven, right? We save the register. So seven and one are being saved. And, and then we're gonna load. So it's gonna check the status. So this is where it's going to write the character as you see the comment there. And so after that, we are going to load because we say we store up here. So we're going to do the load down here. So we're going to load register one and seven. Then we're going to return. And so you do see the process in that we have to store and then load. So that way we can take that value that was stored to return, okay? Because otherwise, what kind of data, how, how are we gonna be able to retrieve the data? So the mechanism is that we still have to set up temporary location so that way we can retrieve those values. Okay. And so again, you would see this table. I think we've seen this before for a different vector for trap. Make sure we know this for final exam and quiz. And in the last lab, we have worked with saving and restore. And we just touch on that briefly now. So we know that we must save the value if that value is going to be destroyed by the service routine. And if we need to use that value for something later on in our program, we have to save and restore. So in your project, I will be looking for those things, right? Because for all the programs that you're writing in your project, you must save and restore. Ask Throughout your program, you would have service routine that will modify or destroy your value. So when we save, what's happening? You have the, the caller and the callee in, in the case of the operation. So when the, the service routine is called, then we know that it's going to be needed later. So we need to save that so that way it's not going to be modified. Now, if it's altered, then it will not, it does not know what will be needed to be for the later call. So you need to make sure that you save right, to a temporary file because it's not going to understand what is modified and what is not modified when we call that service routine, okay? So the example for saving, you've seen this in the lab before. Now, in this one, what we're doing is that we are going to load, right, these label to the register. So here, we are going to obtain a character from the user. We're using a trap 23. Then we're going to ask you convert it. Then we're going to store it. OK, as we do this, we copy the register because it's we're going to copy the register. Then we're going to increment the counter. I mean, the decrement the counter and then we're going to point to it. 
So in the next week, we're gonna talk about pointer, how we're gonna use the pointer through the register. So when you increment the, the pointer, what you're gonna do is you're gonna be associating, right, um, a register to a certain location. And with that, it's gonna be able to retrieve your data. Okay. So here, what you would see is that if you are getting this from register seven, when you decrease the counter, right? If it's positive, it's gonna branch back up here again and it's gonna keep obtaining the character. But what happens to register seven is that it's gonna modify the value every single time. So if you don't save, what's gonna happen is you're not gonna have an accurate output, okay? This is the program that we don't have a save and restore. So before you start calling any subroutine, you need to save. Okay, because if you're expecting any data alteration, then you need to save. Before you return, you need to restore those registers because they have the values. So we talked about how we would save what would be destroyed when the routines are called. If the values are needed later, save register seven before the trap, okay? Save register zero before trap 23. So because register zero is where you would receive input, right? And register zero is where we're gonna load for the output, okay? So when we do that, we can simply copy it to another register or we can use that register as a pointer to the location of our data, where we would load that register with an address and store it permanently to an address. So with that, let's answer the next one. To save the register, right, you must save the value to the register if it is gonna be destroyed by the service routine. And if you need to use this in a later part of your program. And we talked about this in the last lab when you see how save and restore is used for multiplication and division. Any question? Let me move this up a little. So the difference between a called routine and a calling routine is that the called routine, before we start, the register needs to be saved. Before we return, we need to restore. The calling routine, which is known as the caller save, we need to save the register destroyed by the, the instructions or by the routines. If the values are needed later for the trap, either register seven or zero, then we need to save, okay? So as we're doing the call routine, it needs to happen before the start and before the return, okay? So when we say before the starts, before the functions, okay? So you need to save that before. And then for the calling routine, it's gonna be saved within. So save the register destroyed by the instructions. I know it sounds a little confusing, right? But when you write your code, you pay attention to that, right? Normally we'd, we would have the save section before, right? And then before the definition of your subroutine. So as you enter the subroutine, you would have the register prepared for 
you know, as the service call would destroy, so you would have the, the register store the appropriate information, then you can restore it later. Question. All right. So another way, another thing that we need to mention is that for your calling routine, you should not reuse those register. Okay, those register are dedicated for the purpose of in instructions or data that will be destroyed. So we want to make sure that we don't reuse those register. So we need to track our register, right? And then you need to clear out some of the register as they would have some data. So throughout your program, right, if you are reusing register, if you if you save it already, you can clear it and then you can use it for other things. Okay, so let's talk about JSR. You've seen this in the last lab. So JSR stands for jump to the subroutine. And JSRR is like JSR in that it is just using addressing mode. Okay, so that's the, the main difference. So I highlighted the section in the notes that would be different. So JSR computes the target address of the subroutine by sign extended the offset, which is your bit 0 through 11, the 11 bit out of the 16-bit word size. So it's going to take up the 11 bits and it's going to utilize that for the computation of the address, okay? Where JSRR is like JSR, but the address mode, it's going to obtain the starting address of the subroutine and it's going to use the jump instruction and the register specify in a different bit. So it's gonna use bit eight to bit six. So, so those are the two and it's gonna store it to a certain location. So it's purely address mode, okay? Compared to JSR where it's gonna load the address to the 11 bits of the word, word size instruction. So here it talks about how it would be the LDN ST instructions, okay? Whereas JSRR, it's gonna use the physical memory location. It's gonna put that into a certain register where register seven is gonna be loaded with the next location after hex 420A and the PC or the program counter is loaded with the hex 30, uh, 3002. So for the JSRR, it's going to associate with an actual memory address, right? Whereas the JSR, it's going to compute the memory address and it's going to put it into the offset, which is, which is the 11 bit in that word. but you're still gonna be able to have the outcome the same, okay? So the majority of the lab program that we deal with, we are gonna use JSR. The time that you would use JSRR is when you need to retrieve directly from memory. Any question regarding jump to subroutine? So here, uh, a little bit more visualization, right? There's your JS JSR, your 11 bits for address evaluation, and then your opcode is here. It's gonna use the one bit for the setup. So the front is still gonna be the opcode. And so it's gonna save the return address in register seven and it's gonna compute the starting address of the subroutine that's loaded into the PC. 
So when you are calling a function, so when you're using JSR, it's very much like how you put the function call into the main, right? You, when you're calling the function in main, you simply just type in your code, you simply just type in the function name, right? So when that happens, it's gonna, at the low level for LC3, the address is gonna go into register seven so that way it can return for your function, okay? And then it's also gonna go to the location for the instruction after that function is called because you might have multiple functions. Okay, so I can call one function after the next and so on. So it needs to pick up after it complete that function call. And for the answer, you can also refer to page five of the notes. And so when you're looking at how we break down the word size instruction for JSRR, it's slightly different. At the binary level, you can see that it's different. So your, your base register is you know, dedicated for these bits. And then your opcode is still in the front and following that with bit um, 11. But instead of using the 11, offset which is when we say offset that can contain right like a value like a memory address value so forth it's going to utilize only these two bits for the base okay any question regarding chapter nine Okay, so let's touch on libraries a little bit before we transition into 10. So every, since you start learning C or C++, right? Um, for C++ classes like CIS5 or 17, you have used include, right? You incorporate the STL, okay? Your standard library. And in every programming language, you we would incorporate some form of library for certain operations. Um, you know, for my Python class, we we implement modules all the time, right? We import in modules and we access certain class from that module. And in your C++ class, right, you would include various things. So like, for example, include algorithm if you're implementing some type of operations that require that library. So in LC3, we would use dot external or in assembly, you would see assembly languages using dot external. This is a pseudo operations. It's a way that we can tie in other files that would be relevant as library to our application. So whenever that you want to utilize library that is not part of the program, you would be using external or dot external. Okay. So when you look at an assembly program, and if they if you see this, and normally they would have like the location of that file, okay, um, where it would usually be stored in the same directory but it would reference like the path or the location of the file. Okay, so let's talk about chapter 10 and chapter 10 focuses on stack. I think a lot of programming language uh, classes talk about stack and including this class. So we have to learn how to implement stack manually in LC3. Because when you're writing your program in C++, your compiler set up the stack, or you can also implement the stack manually by using pointer. So a stack is just an abstract concept 
where we can implement memory locations for data to be added in and removing. It's an abstract data type. So the visual here shows you how you would use this coin holder and it has a spring. When it's empty, which is the initial state, there's no coin. So when we push in the first coin, it's gonna push the spring down to be adding that first coin. So it's gonna be at the bottom. Then we're gonna add a few more coins. So as we add them, the last coin is gonna be on the top. And this is the same as some of my example, I would use like stacking plates. The first plate that you stack is gonna be on the bottom and that's going to be the first one to push in. So we would have last in, first out. So when I'm removing the coin, the last coin at the top is going to be the first one that's going to leave, that's going to pop. OK? So it's going to use last in, first out. And for the stack, we're only going to use two mechanisms. Push is to add an item and pop is to remove the item. And for those of you who took Python with me or took Python classes, you've seen this being done to container. Okay, you do have the push method and the pop method to add to a specific container. So when we push it in, that element is going to be added or inserted into the stack. And the last one is going to be on top. And that last one is going to be the first to get popped. Now, in Python, you can actually go to different part depending on, you know, how you implement your container. But in general, when you're looking at C or even assembly, right, when you remove an item from the stack, that's the last one that comes in. That's the first is going to get popped. So when we implement stack, we're really utilizing the memory. And when you set up memory location, they are sequential. So all together in a sequence, we would then use what's called a stack pointer to track which part of the stack is the top. So when you push in the value, it needs to update that pointer on which value is at the top at which location, okay? So as we push each of these in, where that data will be stored. So if you look at this picture, right, it's empty. This is a group of memory addresses that are sequential. Then you are gonna push in 18 let's say an integer, 18. And then you're going to push in 31, 5, and 12. So 12 is the last one that comes in. So it's at the top. So what that does is it's going to update the pointer on which value is pushing last, right? Or each of these value get pushed and it's going to update that. So here it's going to say top is going to be 12 and that's going to get pop first. So if I'm popping, it's going to go, 12 is going to go first, then 5, then 31, and then 18 is going to be the last. Okay. So after two pop, we're left with 31, and it needs to update that, oh, 31 is going to be at the, at the top now. Okay. Because we removed two. So the important thing here is that we need to remember that the data items don't move in the memory, just the idea that there is a top of the stack. So this is just an abstract concept where we would think of it that way so we can visualize it. But data don't move around and the memory is dynamically written, right? So it's really associating which address is gonna be referred to as the top after a certain push or pop. 
Okay, so here it shows you the convention. And what we can simply do in LC3 is that we would use a register. And for stacks, right, we would dedicate a location such as hex 4000 for our stack. So here's your initial state where it's nothing. And we would use register six. And so after we push in 18, then we need to update. It's going to point to a different address for R6 because now 18 is at the top, right? And then when we push in three more values, it's going to also update the address to register six. So after three pushes, you see the address changes there. And then, you know, after, um, after we pop the 12 and the five, it's going to also update. Now 31 address is going to be at the top for R6. So we simply use a register to point to the location where the top value should be. Okay. Any question? So here it gives you a little bit of explanation on what I just showed. And then for the push and pop code, it would look like this. So you would have a decrement in the stack where you would take R6 and you're gonna subtract one. And then you're gonna store the data to register zero, okay? And this one we use an STR because when you're using register to register, you're using an STR and with an immediate value here. So as you store for the push, you need to load for the pop because it's the opposite. So when you store last here, when you're getting ready to pop or remove the item, you are gonna load. So you are just simply going to do an LDR, R0, R6, right? So you're going to load the data. Then you're going to add the one. You're going to decrease in the stack, okay? So as we push down, we're going to go down one. Just think about how you're pushing the coin down. You're going to go down one. Then you're going to store that data. But when you're getting ready to pop, you are going to load that data that you store and you're going to move it up one. So you're going to add one. OK, so we want to treat it like how we would visualize it at an abstract level. And in the assembly or the low level, it's very it's very physical that way. Right. Like you have to think about, oh, we're going to move up one. We're going to move down one. So when you're popping too many items, you are gonna suffer from underflow. So we have to check to see, right, if we're having underflow or overflow. So in this case, when we check for underflow, we are going to use a register, right, to determine whether it's overflow or success or underflow. So if it's zero, that's going to be okay. If it's one, it's underflow. You pop too many, too many uh, values or items from your stack. Okay, let's look closer and then we can answer some questions. Um, here, this is a little bit more with the implementation of the underflow detection. So here, I load register one with empty. So empty is going to fill hex 4000. And then we are going to add register six and register one and put that onto register two. Because it's we're going to use the data from register two to compare, right, to branch. Remember that we show here that if it's zero, right? And if it's one, that's what we're trying to check for, okay? So when we have zero, that's gonna go to, so that's gonna go to fail and 
that's going to be at hex 3FFFF, right? Remember how we looked at the address when it we push and pop? Then we are going to do a load, like what we talked about before. We're going to do an increment. And then here is where we're going to check for the success. So if you add, if you, if you and register five with zero, then return. But if it's not, if it's one, then it's, it's going to be an underflow. It fails. Okay. So this is how you can un implement underflow in assembly. I don't require the detection for underflow for the stack, but if you want to go an extra step, that's what you would do. But I will require a stack implementation. So you would have a section for stack. You can also implement a subroutine for stack, um, but a lot of the time you just use push and pop label and be able to go to it. And then you can also use the same technique for pushing underflow, so detection. So it's basically the same. So when you push, right, we load to the label register one, we compare, we branch. If it is zero when we add this, then it's going to go to the fail where we would check for one as a return, return one. But if we return zero, that's going to be success. Very similar to what you've seen in C, C++ when you return zero. Okay. Question. Okay. So now let's answer the next part. For A, describe how the stack is accessed in applications. The last thing that's stored is the first thing that's removed, last in, first out, LIFO. And it's not always like that for all container, right? Some container is first in, first out, but this one is last in, first out. And so the last thing that you put in is the first thing that you remove. That's how the stack is accessed. And there are two operations. We talked about push is when we, we are adding an item or inserting an item. And when we pop, we're gonna remove the item. So TOS is your top of the stack pointer. And remember we, in the example, we're using register six. So this allows us to track the growth of the stack where it would be referencing the top of the stack with, with an address to register six. So when we add an item, right, your, your top of the stack pointer is going to move closer to the zero. Your stack grows downward. And it is used we can use this to check the underflow for before pop, okay? So the whole point of this is to track what's on the top and whether we have underflow is your TOS, top of the stack pointer. And so how can you prevent underflow or overflow of a stack? You hear the term stack overflow, not the website, right? Um, the concepts of stack overflow we would use the, the top of the stack pointer before push or pop to check for underflow and overflow. And, you know, in the design of the program, you have to be mindful of how your data is stored, right? And where it is stored, is it gonna be fitting the location? Right, so in a, a strongly typed language, you, you are forced to really think about the container or the type, the data type that you're using. But in more of the loosely typed language, like Python, JavaScript, things like that, you are not required to implement type all the time, right? It, you know, the, the interpreter for Python would plug that in based on what data you initialize. 
But at the low level, if you're working with assembly, you have to be mindful too of where your data would be and how it's fitting in that location. And so if you're implementing the stack, which is a low, it, an area of your memory, we don't want that to have overflow or underflow. So we are gonna be required to use our top stack pointer. Question. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about interrupt again, right? We're gonna revisit interrupt. I think um, a few, a couple of weeks before our break, we touch on IO. So an interrupt is an unscripted subroutine call. It's triggered by some external event that could be something that's outside of what is intended. So when you have the device signal that needs to be serviced, right, that will be an interrupt. So the processor, what it has to do is it has to save the state and then it's gonna start the service call for that interrupt. Once it finished that service routine, then it's gonna restore the state and resume the program. And so when it saves the state of the program, it's using like what you would refer to as a snapshot of what resources it's using and so that way it can refer back to that at a later time. So that means that it's gonna use memory location because memory location is where content store and that will also entail <coughs> registers, your general purpose register. So there are two registers that are required for the interrupt is gonna be your program counter and your PSR, which is your processor state register. Program counter just contain where the program will pick up, but the processor state register, it contain the status of the running program, which reverts back to what we talked about, the state where the snapshot of the content is gonna exist. So the processor state really refers to the running processes, okay? And registers, as we talked about this since the beginning, that it is temporary and it's nothing permanent about it. It doesn't have any associated, unless you tie that to the memory, but it's not stored to the memory, okay? So in, when we put things into register, it's not permanent. So where it's gonna save is gonna be, so you have a certain bit that's gonna be dedicated to, for, to the status, okay? So bit 15 is gonna be for privilege and for bit eight through 10, that's gonna be priority level. So this is the value of this right here is gonna determine the queue in the priority. You might have multiple interrupts that's happening at once, right? But the priority level is gonna take hierarchy. So it's gonna use these bits here to determine which interrupt to, to service first. And then lastly, you would have the conditional codes. So now for the processor state, it you cannot use just your regular register. When resuming, it's gonna restore exactly to the state using the PC and the PSR, okay? So we don't know, right? If we don't, if we're not expecting any interrupt 
right? We we need to think about how interrupt can occur, okay? Then to really handle the service call for the interrupt, the, the state needs to be saved, okay? So that means that when it's saved, it's gonna invoke that, that routine. And so your service would then be handling that interrupt. And so when you're working with input output, we are always gonna expect some form of interrupt, right? And we talked about how interrupt could be that when we're running on applications, um, we need to pause that application when you hit a certain hotkeys on Windows and so on, okay? Now, when that certain interrupt is, is already being handled after we hit the hot key, like control, alt, delete, and we come back to the application, it really needs to pick up where we, it left off. So it has to continue to run, okay? And so with that, the program counter must save the instructions for what's next. Your conditional codes, your N, Z, and P for branching, right? it needs to be saved based on the conditional instructions that's within the program. And then it's also gonna update the privilege level that happens in, on bit 15, where it's gonna contain the processor resources for the interrupted program. So let's come back here. We're gonna answer the next part, which is number 12. It asks you why is processor state important when working with IO interrupt? Because it provides a complete capture of the running process. In the case where if we have an IO interrupt, it would use that status to resume the program. Otherwise we cannot pick up where the program is left off at the interrupt time. So your processor state needs to be saved. Any question regarding IO interrupts? Okay. And next, we are going to talk about the supervisory stack, okay? We talked about stack where we would have push pop, okay? So push for save, pop to restore. And so the supervisory stack is a, a section of the memory that's used as a stack for just interrupt. Okay, one second, let me swap my, my headset real quick. Give me a second. microphone. Okay. All right, so as we talked about supervisory stack, it's just gonna be used for your interrupt service routines. And it also needs to be saving the information of the state. So it's dedicated only for this purpose. This is different than your user stack, which is what we previously talked about. So the supervisory stack is completely different than your regular stack or your user stack. 
And in this, when we write it in, in LC3, we can use a register to for a bulk stack, like for register six, we would use that as your stack pointer. And so register six would then be associated with your that, that section of memory for your supervisory stack. Okay, or if you prefer to use another register, but just the way that um, the book utilize the example with register six. So by practice, I think they prefer register six for stack usage. As your register six would act as your stack pointer. Now, very much like the other stack, you have a certain set of registers that's gonna handle um, the supervisory stack. So it would be the SSP and the USP. When you, the, the USP is for the user stack pointer and the SSP is for supervisory stack pointer. So when you, when you use your register six, you can load the content and we can save it before processing begins if it's for interrupt in the SSP. You can also do the same thing for the user stack, which is your regular stack that we would manually implement for, um, for data purposes, right? So in the next section, it talks about invoking service routine. And so here, let me move down a little bit. It goes through the process. So for the user, the privilege is going to be one, okay, which is different than the supervisory. So with that, after that, it's going to save or doing that, it's going to save it to the register six. And then it's going to save that the SSP to the register six, okay. Then it's going to push for the the processor state register and the PC to the supervisory stack. So what that is, is going to add the, the state and the program counter address to the location, which is the supervisory stack. And then it's going to check if the bit 15 is zero, then it's going to be supervisor mode, okay? And then it's gonna go to bit eight to bit 10 to determine how high of a priority is that interrupt. If it is high in the level, it's gonna handle that, that service routine. Then it's gonna set the state back to zero. Okay. And then after it completely handled the service routine, it's going to load the memory location to the MDR and then set the PC to the MDR so it can pick up the program where it left off. There's another instructions that we don't use in, the, in our regular lab program. So the program that you've been written is your RTI. This is known as your return from interrupt. So at the low level, this instruction is a privilege instruction. It's being used by the system only. And so it can only be executed in the supervisor mode for interrupt purposes. So if it is gonna, if this is execute in the user mode, then you would have exception. So there are always two modes, your system mode or your supervisor mode and your user mode. Okay. So the privilege for the user mode will not exceed to access the RTI instructions. So when you're using RTI instructions, it's going to remove the program counter from the supervisor stack. So it's going to take pop that, then it's going to pop the PSR 
right? So it's the opposite of what we talked about previously. Then it's going to set your bit 15 to 1 because that was previously 0. And then it's going to save R6 as a USP, which is your user stack pointer. And then the next step you would see here. Okay. So this is an example for adding the interrupt and then for popping the interrupt. I know that stack sometimes can be a little difficult to absorb because, you know, we're trying to visualize different things in different part of memory locations or region. But ultimately, we're using a pointer to be able to update. And your user stack is going to be what we normally access. And then your system stack or your supervisory stack is what's being handled for interrupt internally by the system. Okay, so let's address the next few questions. So the purpose of the supervisor stack is to use it, use a certain region of memory for interrupt service routines. It's only used by the program that's executing in the privilege mode. So when you're looking at malware, especially rootkit, um, you would see that this happens, okay? And, or, you know, for some part of the OS level, you would see some of this, but in the case where for most of our application, we're only using the user program stack. Now, like you would see some malware where it would use the network interface card to connect to a certain device and it would just take over all the resources so it continued to process all of these things trying to execute or it's transmitting data continuously and then the, the system just becoming extremely slow right or non-responsive so it's causing a lot of different interrupt in the back now for 14, the purpose of RTI is gonna be um, that it is an interrupt service routine. It can be executed in supervisor mode. It is a privilege instruction. It will cause an exception or error in the user mode. If you have an internal interrupt, right when something is unexpected happening with the processor it would be an exception it's an error it will be handled like an interrupt and so the vector would then be determined internally by the type of exception and the priority would be the same as the running program So internally, interrupt needs to be handled. And in most case, that will be based on the value where it would differentiate as different exceptions. Any questions regarding our assignment for today? So I encourage you to read the chapters, um, you know, and go through the content, review your notes and your assignments, but reading the chapter is going to help you understand the author, um, give you a lot of good details about stack, supervisor stack, and interrupt. Okay, so next we are going to talk about our project for this class. Any question before we switch to project? Okay, if you are finished, you can submit this assignment today 
um, I will work on grading for the things that you submitted previously and then um, throughout this week. But you can also turn this in on Sunday if you don't want to do it today. Okay, so let's go to, so I posted your project and this, there are two, there are three parts in the project. This is gonna be your group project. So you can decide on who you want to work with, okay? And in all attempts, I would encourage you to do the project. It's gonna allow you to expand your skill in assembly. And even if you feel like you didn't grasp too much assembly, if you work with people in the team, you would be able to expand your skill your programming skill by doing this project, okay? So um, the part one is simply planning out your project and, and assigning your team members task and working on the documentation. So if you go to part one, here you will find the criteria. You can open it or you can download it. Okay. So there would be different option for you to choose to do your project. And for part one, I will grade it based on a hundred points for planning and documentation. So you are to pick your team members and the maximum, it, there are gonna be three students. I don't like very large team because there will be people who don't do anything. So two to three is good, okay? If you have questions regarding team setup, just shoot me a message. So the first part is to look at your project requirement and determine the option that you want to do. Then, um, you would come up with a plan on who's doing what, okay? So here are your options. You can do a bubble sort program, and here I explain how bubble sort work. If you took CIS 17A, you are familiar with bubble sort because in the book, right, for 17A or five, a lot of the time you would see example for bubble sort. So bubble sort, it's just a way that we can compare the value. We want to do ascending order from smallest to highest. So in the case of this, the example that you see here, right, we would be able to exchange the value, okay? In a C++ program, we would set up temp location and be able to do the dynamic allocations using variable or bubble sort. And then you can write a function to be able to handle that. But in LC3, you have to think about how you're going to be able to implement the values, right? And to be able to bubble sort. You can have the user input the value or you would be able to take that value and then put that you know, in an array and then sort it somehow, okay? So here we would see that the smaller value being swapped and then eventually it moves to the next one and then it's gonna compare. So basically you use the comparison operator, right? And in LC3, you need to branch, right? So we can operate the subtraction. If it's smaller, right, we would put it in a certain area so that way we can we can go back and retrieve it later and then bring out the whole set of values. If it's larger, we would move it to, you know, behind that value. So we would set it where we would pull it from the memory location and set it as a later value. Okay, so here we would, we would bubble out or we would compare two values at a time. So that's one option is to do a bubble sort. And so here is the requirement for all program, all options. 
you are going to have addresses. So we need to do fill origination and we are going to talk about array in the next couple of weeks and you have to have input and output. That's going to be 20 points. I'm going to look for that. So with input, ASCII conversion is required, right? Because you have to convert it and then also convert for the output. And we talk, and that's going to entail trap as well. And then for the bubble sort, you have to display the complete set of values that's sorted on the console. Okay, and I will test your program. We, I'm going to look at your code and I'm going to look for label and comments. And then I'm going to look for different operations and instructions. I am expecting two functions or subroutine. And so you have to do JSR for two functions, so at least two. And then I will check for branching and control. So we need to have a loop, right? And we need to have some form of conditions. We need to manage overflow for storage allocation. And I think we handled this when we talked in the last couple of labs, we addressed that. That's 20 points. And then you need to do push pop for the stack. There will be lab example with push pop. Okay. And then I am going to look for save and restore operation in your program. And I will look for a pointer. Okay. ASCII conversion, we touch on that up here, but that's 30 points. And then I will look for system call directives like halt, right, and so on. I need to have tests of your program. So after you successfully write your program, you need to give me some screenshot for your test. And you should test it with a given value or if you come up with better values, that's fine too. Okay, so sort needs to go ascending small to high. Okay. Option B will be a test score calculator. And with the test score calculator, you need to convert the number grade or the percentage to a letter grade. So you would ask the user to input their score, right? We need to calculate the maximum or we need to display maximum score, minimum score, and the average score. So the only arithmetic operation here is going to be the average score so and then you are required the same thing with just like the sort program so stack ascii conversion subroutine the same requirement just for the the grade so i'm expecting to have at least five grades so you can ask the user to input five grades right ascii convert it store it calculate it Right, use the appropriate functions to be able to operate that and then display the maximum, minimum, and, and average. Okay. And we can set up your letter grade as that will be required. This is a popular project option last year when I did this class. So a lot of people did great calculator. Option C is gonna be character counters for names. So you would ask the user to input their full name and then um, count up the frequency of the characters for their name. For example, like letter C in their name, letter A in their name and so on. This one is not too difficult, right? It's using just characters. So you still have to do ASCII conversions and then be able to, to implement subroutines and so on. I previously used um, like an encryption and decryption program, but you know, I change up to character counter for names. It's a little easier for the students. So those are the three options. Then you can, once you decide as a team on what you want to do, 
Okay, let's go back to this page. You will need to um, download this documentation document, okay? What I did was I put together a template for you already, okay? All the purple section and the red section you need to fill in, okay? So read the example and the questions or the, the statement that's put there and then put down what your program objectives is, the functionality of your program, right? Uh, any kind of characteristics, how it's used, okay? So like here, right, for LC3, you need to refer to the LC3 simulator and it needs to be ran on a simulator so that if there's certain things that need to be utilized for your program as far as system, you need to in indicate that. Are there any dependencies? So if there's not dependencies, you can just put not apply or no dependencies are needed, okay? and so on. So there's some sections that's not needed and then there's some, some sections that's needed. So you can go through this, right? Fill out the section where it's purple and red. So remove those and then put in the details for your program, okay? And then I need your flow chart to go here, okay? And I will look for branching in your flowchart. So make sure that we apply that accordingly. You can use Draw.io or you know, an, a cloud application that's free to be able to do your flowchart. I don't mind you using another product to do your flowchart. And if you convert it to JPEG, you can just put that on here, okay? If you're using Word or something, just make sure that you follow the, the flowchart standard, but you know, the important part is to make sure you have to start to the end and in between we want to include, you know, your subroutine, your branches and the conditions applied to those branches, okay? Now, as a team, I will require that everybody submit their own project, even though you share the same document because in the past where I have used, you know, Canvas team submission, it's just chaotic because, you know, some people forget to do, uh, you know, the team parts and then it's just, it's crazy. So everybody submit part one, part two, and part three. So part one, you will be, you will be graded on the documentation and team sign up. Okay, so your team task and your documentation, okay? Now let's say you sign up for the team and you didn't do anything, right? How do I know? Well, there's a team evaluation in part three and I do read that when I grade the project. So your, your score will be impacted. Now, if you did everything that's required, then you would just have a good grade. So how do I sign up for the team? You would click here and it's gonna take you to my Google Docs. I have example for you here. Now let's say that you, you're not sure, right? Um, if you're already sure, you can fill this out. You're not sure you can come back to this in a few days and you can see if someone needs a team, you can you know contact that person. If you need me to contact that person, let me know and I can ask, okay? So put down your team name, team members, and then the type of project that you selected. And here, just give me a, a, an overview of who's doing what. I prefer to have you put down like a due date so that way you know what to do, but at least like put down who's doing what. So that way I can see that you allocated the task, okay? So make sure that you fill this out. Any question on part one? Okay, so part one, documentation and team sign up. Okay, and task allocation. Then you go to part two. Okay, 
part two is purely about the program. So once you selected an option, you are gonna write the LC3 program, which is for part two, okay? And if you want to check this, again, you can find this document. The document would show you what the options are and each of the requirement for the option, for each uh, option requirement. Now, I do know that there are a lot of examples online. And also my former students, they probably post things on theirs, okay? I do use a checker and I do read your code. So use, if you do things, see things online, use them as reference because every semester I find some code that's a copy of somebody's work. And I hate to either drop that person from my class at the end or give them a zero for the project or the class. Okay, so let's use this to make sure that you understand the concept in this class, at least attempt to do the project. Okay, so for part two, make sure that you look at the requirement and then submit the ASM file. You can just upload it, okay, and the screenshot. You can put it in a zip folder, but or you can upload them individually. That's fine, okay. So show me some, some test screen captures and then the LC3 program. And I will run your program along with looking at your, your, your test. Now, let's say that your program doesn't work, right? It works mostly, but you know there's something still wrong with it. You should still submit it for partial credit and your test information. So at least, you know, even if the test and it didn't run, at least submit that, okay? And if you don't turn in anything, I'm going to give you a zero for that part. And that will drop your grade. And look at this rubric, which is the same as the requirement. So I'm going to use this to grade. Okay. Any question on part two? Okay. Part three is where you are going to evaluate your team members. So there's a Google form that you can fill out. It's not very long. You put down your name, your team name, you rate yourself, you rate your team members, you answer some of the questions, right? Um, what were you successful on on the project? What were you not successful on? I do read this. So, you know, I, I look at like what's done a lot. The result from all the years that I have taught with using project is people wait till the last minute and they don't get their project done. So this is why I'm releasing it in week nine instead of week 12. So you should give, you should give yourself plenty of time to do this and you should wrap up your project, right? By week 13 at the most. And then that way you will, you know, study for your final and not have to worry about it. But if you wait till the last few days to do it, I guarantee that you're not going to be done. And that's usually the result that I get from these evaluations. So do not wait till the last minute. Okay, so give yourself some time and your team some time to get things completed. So manage your time accordingly. That's a lot of the team. That's what they said. Like mismatch schedule. We couldn't come up with the time to do our project. We wait till the last minute. We procrastinate. Tons of stuff that's time related. And then if you run across challenges like, you know, oh, we have a hard time implementing stack or we have a hard time doing this. I like to know about it because the next time I teach the class, I will address it. And then when I write the comment to you for your project, which I will, I will address the issues that you run into and point you to the direction on how you can improve that area. Okay. All right. So that's one piece of part three. The second piece, that's 25 points. So after you complete that Google form, you, when you click submit, you're gonna see the submission screen, take a screenshot, upload it. That's what I'm gonna use for grading that, you know, and then I will read it in, in the submission. Then um, you are going to be required to put your project on GitHub. 
The reason why is that, you know, you can use GitHub as a way to maintain your project over time, which I encourage. Um, you can also link your GitHub to your social media account for job purposes. And your GitHub should be an area where you can showcase your work. Um, so keep things organized, okay? I put some example here. So you should have a readme file and on GitHub, if you're familiar with this, but you can use HTML to format this. So that way it would be nice. And so this is my advanced Python example for my class. So there should be a readme.md and you can simply create a file directly in GitHub, or if you create it on your computer, you can you can sync it. And some of you have used REPL before and REPL works directly, you know, with that. You can use Visual Studio and tie it to GitHub. There are many ways. Okay. But um, let me see if I have one for this class. Okay. Maybe not. Okay. So when you submit your, your, when you put your ASM file on GitHub, you can upload the file or you can copy and paste the code in there and save your file with the file extension. Like for example, like month of the year .asm, right? And then, so, but make sure that we have, we can put it in a folder. So if you put like an SRC folder, like a source code folder, you can put the files in there, but the least that I expect is going to be a readme file and an ASM file. And if you want to put your documentation on there, be my guess. Okay, so you can add it. And on GitHub, it shows you how you can add a readme here. But if you don't know how to use GitHub, I did put some resources for you. Okay, there's some links for you to use. So take the time to take a look at how you can set up your repo, you know, and use GitHub with your team. So that way, when you modify your code and things like that, it, it you know, you can branch it where two, three people can work on it. And then you can take a look at the difference and compare. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a good platform for you to, to work together. Okay. So use this page if you're not sure on how to use GitHub. Okay. I encourage you to use branch and pull request simply you can look at the difference from the time that you start until the time that you finish and it gives you the report right on who modify what okay so you can expand the use of github using some of the resources there so in part three to wrap it up screenshot of your completed evaluation submission page right a link to your GitHub URL. Now, a lot of students tell me that they cannot submit the URL after they selected upload, okay? Then type in the, the, the text box, the URL or copy and paste it in. So I give you multiple options to submit and all else fail, put it in the comment. Okay, the URL. Do not skip it because sometimes students they don't they forget to submit this, right? And then I just have to give them a zero. I do not want to go and contact the student and say, hey, do you have a GitHub? Right. You should submit your URL and your evaluation. And so that's 25 points and 25 points. So altogether, that's what your course project would be. Okay, any questions? So if you look at the due date, the first part is gonna be the end of May. Okay, so I put the due date there for you. So the 29th of May is gonna be part one. And then part two and part three is gonna be due on the seventh. Okay, which is the beginning of the final exam. I don't open this until the last day of class anymore because it created so many problems in the past that 
you know, people forget to submit and then it's locked. And so I want to, for it to be submitted like the beginning part of the week. So that way I would have also time to wrap up your project because it takes a long time to grade it um, and be able to give you your grade by the time that you finish the class. Okay, any question? All right, so if you have further questions and you don't wanna ask now, you can email me or you can see me during office hours. If you want me to check out your documentation and your team or your code or have questions about your code later, feel free to do that. Um, you know, I will give you also time that we will finish some part of the class. We will not have a lab. Like in week 12, we will not have a lab. Um, and then I will go over the final review in week 13. So use that lab time to do your project, okay? All right. Any question, concern, comment? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. Please type your name into the chat for attendance.